Welcome to the latest edition of FMC's First Friday event as part of the FMC True Champions program. I'm Mike Sisti, the North America Marketing Manager for FMC Professional Solutions. Uh, this morning, I'd like to hand it over to Jason Hart, who's the latest addition to the FMC team. He'll introduce himself and kick off today's event. Jason? Great. Thanks, Mike. Uh, good morning, everybody. As Mike said, this is uh, FMC's True Champions First Friday webinar series. My name is Jason Hart, and I'm the key customer manager for the Northeast United States pest market. Uh, with that said, I wanted to introduce our speaker today, Brian Mount. A um, little, little bit about Brian. Brian has worked in a number of different management positions in the pest control industry. And currently, Brian is FMC's technical service manager for all insecticides nationwide. And with that being said, I will now turn it over to Ed Damask. Ed. Thank you, Jason. Appreciate it. Uh, my name is Ed Damask. I'm the uh, program coordinator. I handle the CEUs and, and the registrations for this program. Uh, I just want to let you know what states we're registered in. I see a lot of familiar faces, if you will, in the chat. Uh, so welcome. And a special shout out to the PMP from Hawaii. I know it's very early there, so thanks for coming. <laughs> uh, we are approved in Arizona, California, Colorado, Connecticut, Florida, Hawaii, Maryland, Michigan, Nevada, New Jersey, New Mexico, Pennsylvania, South Carolina, and West Virginia, so 14 states. We're already approved for next month in about 10 states. So make sure you sign up for our uh, April webinar because that might uh, be our biggest one yet for approvals. Just a couple of ad administrative notes for you to know. Uh, your CEUs, please don't email wondering where everything is until about two or three weeks have gone by. Within one week, you will receive our follow-up email that'll have your certificate of attendance. That's not your CEU, that's just proof you were here. Um, then in the meantime, I will be submitting your information with your license number to each individual state. That's how the process works. Uh, during this webinar, there will be two keywords that Brian will control. At that point, we will stop, we will go to the uh, chat box, which we're also good at, at talking about, and we'll uh, type in something. I'm just typing in test right now. Uh, he will have specific keywords that the states require us to ask you to make sure that you're not uh, doing something else, that you're paying attention. Lastly, there will be a quiz at the end, and we'll do that online. I'll put the link in the chat box, and then you can do it. It takes about two minutes. I did it this morning. And then um, that's part of the CEU process as well. Uh, before I hand it over to Brian, two last things. Questions and answers, there's a Q&A box. Uh, you can see Keith already posted a question in there. Please post as many as you can. And when we have breaks or at the end, we're very happy to answer as many as possible. And lastly, uh, it's no joke, April Fools. April 1st is our next webinar. That will be termite control wood treatments. Uh, that is the first Friday in April. So with that, I'll pass it along to Brian. All right, well, thank you, Ed. And I'll start uh, sharing a screen here, hopefully. All right, so hopefully you all can see that. Um, so thank you, uh, Ed, for the introduction and Jason and, and Mike. Uh, so today we're gonna talk a little bit about mosquito uh, biology and control. Um, we got about maybe 40 slides, 45 slides, something like that. So we'll go through these. And then uh, <clears throat> as uh, Ed said, there will be a couple of keywords. So when I put the slide up with the keyword, we'll give you a minute or so to enter that in the, the chat box. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started. So really what we're gonna do today, uh, first off, we do a safety share, um, look at mosquito life cycle, a little bit on behavior and distribution, and then a little bit on management as well. So today's safety share, you know, spring is coming soon, uh, maybe not so much for the uh, participant in North Dakota, um, but it is coming soon for, uh, for most of the rest of us. And really this is a time to 
make sure you check your uh, your mowing and trimming equipment tools that you're going to be using out there in the yard uh, to help with your uh, spring cleanup. So sharpen blades on mowers and cutting tools, check oil levels and motorized equipment, check tires for uh, appropriate air pressure, uh, also for any punctures or cracking on the tires, uh, lube all necessary fittings and parts. If you're going to use a ladder, check it for safety and, and any kind of damage or worn out areas on those. Uh, last thing you want to do is be on a ladder and have it uh, fail on you. Um, then also check the work area. So if you're going to be mowing your grass for the first time, just go out and check that, you know, there aren't any, uh, isn't any debris out there. So rocks or branches or other things that may have fallen into that area and uh, may interrupt with your mowing or, or be thrown by a mower, you know, into a window or somewhere else. So, so that's the, uh, that's the safety share. Um, just make sure before you start your, your spring cleanup, you do check, uh, all your equipment and your surroundings. So mosquito uh, life cycle. Uh, this is pretty pretty simple, but you know, just a reminder: um, mosquitoes do go through um, uh, several different life stages. Uh, you have the adult, uh, the eggs, the larva, pupa, then they emerge out, out of the water as an adult. But those immature stages are uh, aquatic, so they are in water. And that's something to remember, you know, when you're starting to look at, you know, how to control mosquitoes on a property. And we'll get into that a little bit more uh, as, we, as we move forward here, but just an important aspect of their, of their biology. Give an idea of, you know, what some of this egg laying looks like. This is a Culex mosquito. Uh, they lay their eggs in little rafts. So they kind of glue them all together um, into a raft that floats on the water surface until they hatch and then they move under, under the water surface. Um, these are kind of what the larvae look like. Uh, they're also uh, called wigglers. Uh, these are things when you look into, say, a container of water that has mosquito larvae in it. Uh, these guys will start squirming around, moving around rapidly, um, and then also move down from the surface uh, where they might have been hanging out. Pupa, um, this is the stage, you know, prior to them turning into adult mosquitoes, it does kind of hang out towards the surface, but it will drop down uh, if disturbed on the surface. So. Uh, this is kind of a good look at what they look like. So some breeding sites, um, you know, a lot of times you think about mosquitoes and you think about you know, maybe they're coming from a pond or a lake or, you know, maybe a, a really wet area along a, a river system, something like that. But in reality, a lot of the breeding sites are these, you know, I'd say non-traditional, but I think they become, you know, probably the, the most, some of the most prolific breeding areas. So things like old tires. Um, you know, huge, huge problem. So a lot of tires laying around, they hold a lot of water. Uh, it's enough for mosquitoes to breed in. Uh, over on the left-hand side, you've got, you know, debris in a yard. Um, you've got tarps there, you've got tires there, you've got a wheelbarrow there, you've got an old crib there. Um, and a lot of these contain materials that will hold water. Um, so, you know, areas like this definitely need to be checked and, uh, I know, uh, you know a lot of you will laugh, but if you ask the homeowner to clean it up, I'm sure they will, right? Uh, probably not. Um, but again, I look at these areas and say, hey, there's opportunity there too. Maybe for you guys to offer to have that cleaned out and you know, maybe there's a little bit of revenue there for you. Um, you know, water along the banks of rivers uh, you know, uh, can become stagnant, especially if there's a little bit of overflow, then it, it, it settles back down. Uh, all areas uh, that mosquitoes would uh, be able to breed in. You know, jars, um, you know, sitting out, you know, holding water. It's plenty of water for certain species to breed in, uh, especially your 80s uh, species. Um, it's, it's absolutely enough for, for them to uh, reproduce. And then really anything that holds uh, water. So, you know, clogged gutters, kiddie pools that were left out, um, debris and trash piles, you know, uh, bird baths, even a low spot in the yard, if you have, you know, a spot that maybe occasionally gets water, uh, there are species that can lay eggs right there and wait for the water to come, and they can actually um, reproduce there as well. So lo lots of different areas, anything that retains water. So some mosquito facts, you know, there's about 3,000 different species in the world, so quite a few uh, numbers of species. Um, males don't bite uh, animals or humans. The females do, and they really do this to, to get a blood meal, to be able to uh, 
get the proteins to produce the eggs that they're going to be laying um, in the future. So really the females are the only ones that actually will, will bother us. Um, they also, uh, both males and females, do feed on nectar for energy. So it's not just, you know, you know blood that, that she's after, um, but they do feed on nectar. So if there's a lot of flowering plants um, around the property, um, that's a source of energy for mosquitoes as well. And maybe some area to be checked. Uh, they can be attracted to CO2 from about 100 to 150 feet away. So again, they can find that CO2 trail and follow it back uh, to you. And then what they'll do is they'll actually use uh, chemoreceptors um, looking for heat of, of their target host. And that brings them really in close to you and then they can, can bite. Um, they do have a proboscis, which they can puncture your skin with. And they can transmit disease. Um, one last thing here, I saw an article recently, I don't know if anybody else caught it, but um, there was a, a piece written uh, on what colors attract mosquitoes. And what they determined was the color red was the most attractive uh, to mosquitoes. Um, they weren't exactly sure why, but um, it just seemed to be one that they preferred. Uh, they you know, basically said it didn't have anything to do with the color of blood. So don't, you know, that, that's kind of maybe a more morbid thought, but um, it, it just was a color that they did prefer. All right, so looking at, you know, some of the different uh, types of mosquitoes that you may encounter, uh, the Culex, uh, so there's a couple of different species here, uh, Quincevasciitis and, and Pipians. Um, these guys um, are known as the Northern and Southern house mosquitoes. They lay eggs in rafts uh, in a variety of habitats, such as temporary groundwater, um, they can be polluted or, or not, doesn't matter for these guys. Um, they'll also uh, lay eggs in artificial containers. Uh, so old cans, tires, uh, anything that has that water uh, available to them, uh, they can lay eggs there. Um, the larvae are vertical in the water, um, perpendicular to the surface. Uh, they, the adults rest with their body flat on a surface. So if they landed on you, the body is gonna be uh, relatively flat. Um, one key thing with this one, um, it does feed, uh, tends to feed higher up in the canopy of trees. So, you know, when you're looking at treatment and um, one of the reasons why it's, it's important to know what species you're dealing with is that your treatment may be targeted um, in a little bit different areas depending on the species that are present. And with this one, uh, they're up high, they're up 15 to 25 feet uh, because one thing they do feed on quite a bit is birds. Uh, and this one is also uh, a West Nile vector. So um, <clears throat> when you treat, uh, if you can identify the species, helps target that treatment. Um, you know, treating up higher in the vegetation, you know, sometimes may require uh, possibly a little bit different licensing depending on, you know, the state that you're in. Uh, it may not, uh, but it is something to just consider and to be aware of. So distribution of the Culex. So these guys are, are pretty widespread. Um, you can see uh, they do cover most of the US up into Canada, uh, Mexico, and then other parts of the world as well. So this is one that is definitely here. Uh, it's one that we have to be aware of. Uh, again, it is a West Nile uh, vector. So it is responsible for uh, the transmission of uh, West Nile um, throughout the US here. Give you an idea, you know, I, I talked about how this one is up higher in the canopy. You know, looking at you know trap counts on, on Culex, um, you can see you know in the ground that's a small uh, bar on the left. Um, very few they captured 31 in this test. Um, then up high in the canopy they captured 840 mosquitoes. Uh, this was over I believe a 24 hour period or so. So again, a little bit higher up for this guy. So if you're going to treat for this one, you know aim high, right? Look a little bit higher up. All right, so now moving on to uh, uh, Aedes aegypti. Uh, this is also known as the yellow fever mosquito. And, you know, some distinguishing characteristics are, you know, this, you know, distinct uh, uh, white uh, banding on the legs. Uh, also, if you look where the red circle is, um, I do have, um, see if I can get my pointer to work here. Um, so right in here, uh, you've got this pattern on the front here, right? So it kind of looks like a violin maybe uh, type patternation. Um, that's a way you can tell this one from the next one we'll talk about, which is Aedes albopictus, uh, a different patternation there, but they do look very similar with the white markings. 
So these guys, um, they uh, deposit their eggs in artificial containers, either just above the water level or, or on the surface of the water. Uh, they do pass through winter in the egg stage, um, but they can continuously breed throughout the year uh, in warmer climates. I'm down in Florida and mosquitoes, I don't think ever stop here. You know, we had one frost this year that might've you know, put a damper to them, but uh, they're pretty much here all year round. Uh, eggs can remain viable and hatch after being held for one year, so pretty robust. Um, and these guys are found in, again, those artificial containers, the tree holes, um, any container on the ground that holds water, uh, you'll find the, uh, the larval stages. All right, so with that, our first key word is totality. So please uh, enter that into the, uh, the uh, chat box. Okay, while we're doing that, I'm gonna go to the Q&A. Uh, since Keith gave us this question before we even started, let's give him the first answer. Uh, what other active ingredients can I use to suppress mosquitoes that are not in category three mode of action class? Oof, yeah, it's, it's tough. There's not a lot of classes out there. Um, you know, Today there's there's the pyrethroids, um, and then there's uh, more on the um, mosquito district side. Some of the organophosphates, um, but there, there's really not a bunch of choices beyond that uh, for mosquito control. But stay tuned. I, I, you know, again, we're manufacturers, so there's always new things in in, uh, in the works. So, um, but I would say the majority are are your uh, your pyrethroids. Um, and then the use of, you know, IGRs and things like that can also help out and break that. Okay, and I'll give you one other quick one and let you get back to your presentation. Um, Delaney asked, isn't what we call a bite actually referred to as piercing and sucking? <laughs> yeah, I guess you could say that because they are piercing your skin and they're, they're, uh, they're, they're sucking out some blood, but they do have that well-defined proboscis, uh, you know, that will, will puncture that skin. So. Yeah, I could buy that. Okay, there we go. Um, All right. Back to you. Very good. All right, so a little bit more on uh, Aedes aegypti. Um, so the adult, uh, you know, the females here, they're, they're pretty wary in feeding. Uh, they'll attack around the ankles. They might even crawl under the clothing to uh, find a good spot to, uh, to, to feed. Um, these guys like to feed in the shade during the daytime. Uh, but they'll also feed in uh, inside. I'll get into your house at night. If there's lights on, um, you know, they'll still feed. So again, a lot of times you think about mosquitoes as, you know, being that nighttime biter. Uh, but again, this species uh, does like to feed during the daytime and, you know, fairly low on people's bodies, you know, for the most part, uh, which, you know, if, if you're talking to a customer, you're at a property, they're getting bit during the daytime. Uh, this is a good candidate for maybe the one that they're dealing with. Um, they also like to rest, they'll, they'll get inside, they'll, they'll get into you know, cabinets, behind doors, you know, shaded areas uh, inside as well. Um, and they probably don't fly more than maybe 100 feet from where they hatch from. Uh, so they don't travel really far looking for a meal, uh, unless I guess they're, they're really, you know, they're not finding something really that close. Uh, they may venture out further. Um, they're definitely capable of it, but typically they're gonna stay pretty close to where they hatched out from. So, Looking at 80s aegypti, uh, this is a map. Uh, this is an older map. I have a newer one, a um, couple more slides from this, uh, which shows both 80 species. But you can see you know, most of the um, Gulf Coast of the US, you know, up the East Coast a little bit as well on this one, and then you know, other areas throughout the world. They're also a dengue uh, fever uh, vector. So you'll see some of that uh, red in some of those areas as well. Uh, Aedes albopictus, uh, this is your Asian tiger mosquito. Remember I showed you on Aedes aegypti, that's sort of that violin marking here on the front. This one has more of just a straight um, white line, but you can see the white banding on the legs and, and the body uh, is very similar to, uh, to Aedes aegypti. Um, this one uh, also came in a little bit later, uh, I would say introduction into the US, but um, it sort of took over a lot of the, the areas where uh, Egypti um, had a stronghold. So definitely along like the coastal Carolina areas, this one is the more prevalent now. 
Um, this one is a possible Zika virus vector as well. And if you remember, that was a disease that was just all over the news about four years ago, uh, especially in Florida. Um, it was affecting, you know, unborn uh, children that were being born with um, some, some serious medical conditions. So the good news is this is, seems to have uh, kind of waned a little bit. We haven't really heard much about it, um, you know, since then. So uh, not, I want to say not an issue right now, but not a, not a major issue for sure. So these guys um, do deposit their eggs, uh, again, just above the, uh, the water level or on the surface. Uh, they also pass through winter in the egg stage. Um, it does prefer artificial breeding sites, so it is sort of a domestic species. Um, and again, those old tires, tarps, other man-made containers um, is really what this one prefers to, uh, to breed in um, and readily will, will bite you for sure. So again, some of the things we already showed, but um, tree holes like this, so where there's an you know, old branch was on a tree, there's been some rot there, there's kind of just a hole or opening in that tree. Uh, they love these types of areas to get into. Sometimes the crotch of a tree, uh, if there's a, enough area there to hold water, uh, they'll breed in there as well. You know, old tire tracks or ruts like this, uh, when they fill up with water, you know, they're more than happy to breed there as well. So this guy, again, a little, little bit more on it, a very persistent uh, daytime biter. Um, did come from Southeast Asia. Uh, it's been successful in, in eliminating the yellow fever mosquito in some areas, but also uh, has become a troublesome mosquito for us uh, in our homes. Uh, it's a weak but speedy flyer, uh, relatively shy and sensitive to uh, movement by the host. So in that case, you know, it, it sounds great. You move and it, it goes away, right? Well, no, it just comes back and, and will, uh, you know, bite many times. <laughs> so, um, you know, kind of a, a distinct characteristic. It'll just keep biting, you know, go, you know one time after another. Um, prefers to bite below the waist. Uh, spends much of its time resting in lower vegetation. So as a difference between the Culex and this one, you know, your target area for treatment be down in lower areas, right? So not up high like, like the Culex. So again, another reason why it's sort of important to know what species are out there. Um, this was Albopictus uh, 2007. So you can see most of the Eastern United States as far as we're concerned and then, you know, other parts of the world as well. Um, this was an updated slide I got uh, from CDC. I think this was 2017 or so, um, but it does show up in the blue here Egypti and uh, Albopictus down here. And really to look at the darker colorations is really where, um, where they are. So, you know, Eastern US, Southern half, uh, and even up the West Coast uh, in some cases as well. So Anopheles, um, this one, uh, if you look at the adults, they do rest with their abdomens, you know, at a discrete angle to the surface. So if they're resting, I'm gonna back up one slide. You can see how they're kind of you know, up on an angle. They don't rest flat to the surface like some of the others. Um, let's see, they uh, deposit eggs uh, individually on the surface of the water. Um, so they like uh, freshwater streams, ponds, and other uh, aquatic areas with vegetation. So these guys are a little bit different. Um, you know, they, they do prefer more of that clean water source. Um, their eggs uh, are singularly on the surface uh, like their 80s but they have floats on either side. And I'll show another quick chart with that in a minute that kind of shows what that looks like. But, so that is pretty distinctive for these guys. Uh, so their eggs have these little floats on either end, on the sides uh, to help keep them above water. Um, they can't survive drying out or desiccation. Um, the larvae lie horizontally to the water surface. Um, and uh, they don't possess a, a breathing siphon like some of the others. Uh, let's see. Um, the adults do overwinter as uh, fertilized females uh, in colder climates. Um, the overwinter, overwintering adults uh, stay in protected shelters, such as you know maybe uh, in, in outbuildings, tree holes, you know maybe under bark, just areas where they can be protected, you know, throughout the winter. And these guys like to feed at dusk and dawn. Uh, they are a malaria vector as well. So this was. Um, 
it was problematic in the U.S. Uh, gosh, way back um, during the Civil War times, you, you had a lot of a lot of deaths uh, in the U.S. from malaria. Uh, we have since uh, pretty much eradicated it from the U.S., though we do see small pockets from time to time uh, down in Florida and uh, in the South. So this kind of gives you the distribution of Anopheles. Now there's a lot of different species, so um, you know they do cover a lot of a lot of different uh, areas of the world. Uh, but you can see the eastern half of the U.S. does have uh, specific species. Uh, this is Quadrimaculatus, and um, again, pretty prevalent on, on the west on the eastern U.S. So overall, mosquitoes, you know, they do carry a bunch of diseases that can affect us, uh, from malaria to dengue fever to encephalitis, West Nile, and Zika. Um, I, I would say worldwide, you know, deaths from mosquitoes. I've seen numbers in the 200 million range. Um, so they are, you know, a very serious concern, um, especially in developing parts of the world uh, where they don't have real good control programs like we do in the US. Um, so they can definitely really, you know, uh, be something that can harm us. Um, let's see, uh, malaria. So this is your Anopheles mosquitoes. Uh, here, here's your, uh, your, your uh, number of infections per, per year. 300 to 500 million annually, and one to one and a half million uh, die annually from, uh, from malaria. So, you know, very, very uh, serious disease. Uh, if you are traveling anywhere, you know, out of the country, especially in the tropics, definitely want to make sure you do get the right uh, treatments prior to going uh, to help prevent you from getting any of these diseases. This is the malaria map today. So again, you can see the U.S. pretty much uh, in the clear with the green, but other parts of the world, um, you know, you do have some pretty serious uh, transmission in, in Africa and uh, parts of Asia, South America as well. Um, dengue fever, uh, this is your 80s aegypti and albopictus. So again, lots of cases here too, about 20 million annually, about 24,000 deaths. That is rarely uh, fatal. Um, but in Florida, we did have an outbreak back in the 2009, 2010 uh, time range. Um, so again, it can, these, some of these diseases can make their way back to the US. Uh, there's the dengue map. So you see a couple pins in Florida there, um, but again, not a, not a huge concern. So this chart um, kind of gives you a summary of, you know, some of the different species, um, some of their biting activities, you know, daytime or night, uh, where they like to breed, what are they looking to breed in here? Um, diseases that they can transmit. So it kind of just puts everything together for you in, in a quick little chart. Um, and I'll say again, the biting activity, the resting areas, things like that are, are what's going to be important in control. All right, so now a little bit into um, control. So integrated mosquito management. Um, this is something that um, I want to say is new, uh, but it is really um, something from the American Mosquito Control Association, um, you know, some of their best practices, but really it's not that different from you know, integrated pest management, right? So you, you really wanna be able to use as many tools as possible. So not just going out and spraying, um, but you wanna go out and, and inspect, you know, look for you know, those uh, breeding areas, right? Um, dump over those things that are full of water, remove some of that debris, uh, maybe look at some biological controls. Uh, some habitat manipulation, and then also incorporating, you know, chemical controls uh, for, for adults and or uh, larva. Uh, so really, it's a comprehensive uh, mosquito prevention and control strategy that utilizes all available mosquito control methods. So again, just a real good combination. These are things we've been doing, you know, for other pests uh, in the past as well. So really four critical areas here, surveillance, um, mapping, um, and then really a setting of action thresholds. Uh, and really what they're talking about here is you, you go out and look at a property, right? You wanna kind of see, you know, what's the, what's the pressure here? You know, uh, are there things, you know, around this, this structure that are gonna be conducive um, to mosquitoes? Um, you know, action thresholds, it's kind of a funny one to me because uh, I think most people would say zero, right? They, they don't have a threshold. Well, I could get bit five times this week and that'll be fine. Uh, they probably want zero, you know, as far as being bitten. Uh, unfortunately, you know, we really can't promise that. 
because as you saw, you know, mosquitoes can fly from several hundred feet away uh, and come into a property. So um, you know, those are conversations to have with your customer, you know, uh, prior to, uh, to treating. I would never guarantee 100% you're not going to get bit because you're going to set your, yourself up for failure doing that. Um, but there's also, you know, physical control through manipulation of the mosquito habitat. So again, just getting rid of those water sources, um, maybe trimming, you know, shrubs and, and things like that down a little bit more. Um, larval source reduction, uh, again, that's, you know, uh, potentially eliminating those, um, those water sources, which is really a key. Uh, and then you really you want to monitor for, you know, how well your treatments are doing. Um, Part of this also has to do with, with resistance. You know, we had the question about you know, what modes of action are there? And there's not a whole lot. Um, there is a, a, a way that you can actually take uh, mosquito eggs. You have to have the eggs to, to do testing on, but they can be sent in uh, for testing. If you want more information on that, you can contact me um, directly. But um, typically this is something that the mosquito control districts do, not you know, the, uh, the pest control operators out there. Um, it's more of, again, a, a mosquito dish, control district uh, activity where they'll send in eggs, they'll hatch those eggs, they'll put them in the bottle, bottle bioassays and see if there is any resistance. So again, we talked a little about mosquito control districts. So um, again, these guys do more surveillance, they do more trapping, things like that. Uh, professional pest control, um, We'll go out, we'll, hopefully you go out and you actually walk the property, you look for those things like the resting sites, like the breeding sites. Um, action threshold, we covered that a little bit. Um, and then you, you may actually apply you know, residual treatments uh, and or uh, treatments for the larva as well. And we'll get into that a little bit. So larval source product reduction, uh, eliminate those breeding sites, get rid of all that you know, old tires. Um, but don't, don't just stop there, you know, look up, you know, are there clogged gutters? Um, Clogged gutters can hold water, which is enough for mosquitoes to breed in. So I always say, you know, don't forget to look up. Um, that can help you out as well. Um, let's see. Uh, um, you know, when, you, when there's different breeding sites, you know, some of them you can't actually get rid of. So say somebody has a, a pond in their backyard or there's you know, other water sources around. Um, some of those can be treated with, you know, things like, uh, like BTI or other larvicides. So um, you can't just get rid of all of them, um, but I would caution that before treating any kind of bodies of water, you know, definitely make sure that the product is, is labeled for it. Uh, also make sure that you do have the right licensing to do that because some, some states it's a different license than what you may have. Um, and also you wanna make sure that that body of water is on that property and it's not part of a different property. So um, some cautions there. Talked about these sites, again, remove those. All right, next uh, keyword is, is Tall Star Pro. And I'll come back in here and see if we can ask, answer a couple questions uh, during this. With the recent release of genetically modified male mosquitoes, how do you anticipate that control method will play out? <laughs> Um, good question. I know they've um, released, you know, basically what they're, they're kind of sterile males, I guess, uh, in a lot of ways, so they can't reproduce. Um, you know, it, it's a tactic that gets a lot of blowback from the community because they don't understand it. So they're thinking, oh my gosh, they're putting out genetically modified mosquitoes. You know, they're going to, you know, be, you know, these, these huge mosquitoes or, you know, they're going to be affected in different ways than, um, really what they're intended to do. So, yeah, I think th that can definitely help, but, um, you know, it's very, very minor at this time. I mean, I think there were a couple of counties in Florida that maybe tried it, especially down in South Florida. Uh, not familiar with other areas that have done this, but until it's really broad based, um, you know, it, it's gonna have an impact, but it's gonna be small. Um, and then you also have to get over the public perception of that. And then whether you do it now or later, uh, Megan asked if you can have Brian, if, if you can put up the slide with the photo of the eggs again at some point. <laughs> okay. Just so they can get a better look at that. Yeah, yeah, I can do that. Yeah, we can do that at the end. I'll okay. go back to it. Okay, I'll let you go. 
All right. All right. So integrated mosquito management um, does combine several things. So looking at, you know, larval control. So there's some biological things, right? So there's um, things like types of fish you can put into bodies of water that feed predominantly on um, uh, mosquito larva. Uh, there's predaceous copepods uh, that will feed on those uh, as well. Uh, bats, right? Bats eat a lot of uh, mosquitoes. Uh, you know, birds, you know, eat a lot of mosquitoes. Um, dragonfly nymphs in a water, water body uh, definitely will eat a lot of uh, mosquito uh, uh, larva. So again, lots of things you can do. Uh, you know, I, I don't think any one of these is gonna, you know, be 100% effective, um, but, you know, they, they can definitely, you know, add to the impact of, of mosquitoes in a certain area. Um, you know, source reduction, we talked about that a little bit as well, getting rid of those uh, breeding containers and areas. Um, one interesting thing I saw actually found here recently was uh, a mechanical control using acoustic energy to kill larva in, in a body of water. Um, it's kind of a new one to me. Uh, you know, don't know how effective it is or, or how it may affect other organisms in there, but uh, it is something that, uh, that came up from, this was from the CDC website. So just thought it was interesting that you can actually use uh, acoustic energy to kill mosquito larva. So something, something different. Now, again, I don't, I don't think anybody's gonna go out there and, and buy this equipment and, and try that. So, uh, but it's something that is available. Um, so chemical controls, you know, you do have your uh, bacterial larvicides, your, your bacillus thuringiensis, um, some others, you know, spinosad. Um, then you also have your insect growth regulators. And then there's also certain things like oils and films that can go on the surface of the water, which will prevent the larva from being able to breathe and, uh, and you know, mature into adults. So we got a lot of things here on this, this page, but I would say the majority of these are, are probably things that you may not really get into. But again, if you do, um, just make sure you do have the right licensing to, to treat bodies of water. So for adult mosquitoes, um, you know, we talked a little bit about there are mosquito control districts that go out and spray, uh, whether it's through a truck mounted sprayer or through aerial application, which they do a lot of down here in Florida. Um, typically what they use, uh, they're non-residual products. So they'll go out and they'll treat. Um, it knocks down whatever's in the air that it contacts that night or that you know, evening. Um, but then there's no residual to it. So again, you get a knockdown of a population, but nothing left behind. So where, where you all come in is, you know, there's a treatment uh, with adult decides uh, that have residual uh, to areas around a home or recreational areas. You can treat the perimeter of homes. So up around the eaves, so up under the eaves, um, under the gutters, um, shady areas uh, around the home. And, you know, again, as long as those areas are, are shaded and protected, you can treat or protected, you can treat up there. Um, you know, a lot of the pyrethroid products today talk about different limitations on treatments on the sides of structures. But if it's somewhere that has a protective, um, you know, soffit over it or roof over a porch, something like that, you can definitely treat up in those areas with, uh, with those products. Um, and again, those are shady areas that uh, mosquitoes are going to want to rest into. Um, foliage around a property, so up to 25 feet high, you know, for something like a Culex mosquito. Um, but again, you know, as, as your local um, uh, licensing permits or rules permit. Um, foliage is an area that, you know, shrubs around the house. Mosquitoes love to rest in those areas because they're, they're shaded during the day. They probably even hold some moisture during the day. Um, and um, it's just an area that they can hang out in, wait for you to walk outside. If there's, if there are 80 species, they can come out and bite you during the day. If there's other species, they may wait till evening and then start getting active again. Um, you know, decks, uh, pools and patios where people spend a lot of time. Uh, again, as long as those areas are, uh, have shaded areas uh, where mosquitoes are gonna rest, you can definitely uh, treat those areas. Uh, just be careful around pools. You know, a lot of times people hang out out there, there's gonna be shrubs and things around pools, uh, possibly even, you know, covered patios around the pool area. Um, just pay, pay attention not to get uh, products into the pool. Um, it's just, uh, just good practice. Um, Always walk a property before you treat to identify, you know, obviously what you want to treat and then areas that you want to avoid. 
so you know i think my next slide i might have something on on pitfalls around a property but um you just want to make sure you're not going to be treating into um you know herb gardens right um or into if they have an ornamental fish pond on the property uh, make sure that you know those things are not in areas that you're going to treat if you walk it first make a mental note of where those areas are then you come back and, and treat you'll be you'll be much better off um, and that's kind of what I talk about here. So <clears throat> yeah, you want to identify you know, any hazards around that property. And they could be, again, things like fish ponds, bird baths, pet food, you know, pets in general, uh, people. You know, is there somebody out there hanging out where you're going to want to treat? Um, you know, open windows on, on the property. So if you're going to go and do a treatment around you know, the soffit area of the house or the shrubs, a lot of times those are in front of windows. So just you know, make sure those are closed. Uh, you know, wells that may not be sealed. Uh, toys, these can be you know, pet toys or kids toys. You really don't wanna go just treat over top of those things because you know, you're gonna get a call, hey, did you treat over my kid's soccer ball? You know, something like that. Um, so if you know in advance that, hey, you moved all that stuff out of the way, you're good. Uh, tripping hazards, you know, look for things like that. You know, vegetable gardens, you know, fruit trees. Um, you know, I've been with FMC about 22 years now. And I get a lot of these phone calls when they come in about, you know, what do I do if somebody treated my vegetable garden? And, you know, the, the answer is, you know, if it was with something that doesn't have vegetable gardens on the label, which is, I'd say, 99% of your insecticides used for general pest control and for mosquito control, you're going to replace that garden for that customer. So, again, just watch for those types of things. And if you have a question, you know, ask the customer, hey, is this an herb garden? Or are they just weeds? Who knows? Um, but just you know, ask those questions. And uh, it's, it's better to do that first and treat over it. And then they say, hey, you treated my garden. Um, so again, so sample larva and adult control program. Um, you know, I, I always like um, you know, making a map of the property or a graph of the property because you can refer to that for your future visits. Um, it helps you answer questions, you know, back at the office, hey, did you treat this area? If you have a little diagram of the property, just a quick sketch, um, you can mark the areas that you treated and the areas that were of concern. Uh, those gutters, again, clean those clogged gutters out. Um, use an IGR uh, or a bacillus uh, type product uh, where you may have larva. Um, Something like our, our scion insecticide. Uh, this is a, a pyrethroid, it's gamma. Uh, can be used around the property. Um, and uh, got some rates there as well. So it's, it's 0.3 ounces per thousand. So, you know, a lot of times I get questions, you know, from, from lawn care folks, you know, looking to maybe do some mosquito control as well. And, you know, are there any special equipment needs to do that? So really likely if you're doing any kind of lawn or shrub care, uh, you probably have uh, the, the equipment that you need. So things like a spray rig or a backpack sprayer uh, or a backpack mist blower. Um, you know, a mist blower is a really good tool. You know, if you have one, great. If not, you know, the other, other, app, other uh, application equipment can work well. But the mist blower does allow you to penetrate you know, a little bit more into foliage, uh, probably even put out a little bit less volume of product but get a really good coverage uh, as well. So again, you know, there's no real specialized equipment uh, needed um, for, for control uh, of mosquitoes. So some sample areas of treatment. So this is a you know, typical type home you would see. You've got you know, shrubs here, you've got a, a front porch area here, um, some soffit areas along here. So where are you gonna treat? So really, again, those shrub areas, the soffit areas, more shrubs, more shrubs, then up under the uh, protected uh, ceiling there. Um, I can tell you, you know, uh, up under here. So this probably is about 10 feet uh, of protected area, you know, above this front door. Um, mosquitoes love to be in that area. And um, I can tell you because this, this actually is my house and, um, you know, I'll walk out there and there's mosquitoes just all hanging out, you know, up on that, that ceiling area. Um, yeah, you would think that, you know, from what I do, I have time to treat. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, I don't have a whole lot of time to be out there because I travel, I do a lot of other stuff. So, um, but yeah, they do like to hang out in those shady areas. Um, 
you know, during the daytime. And you can see, I can see them there all the time. So other potential areas for treatment. So you've got areas like, you know, a garage over here, you've got shrubs down through here, you've got good soffit area up here. Um, this is a planting, you know, a little bit out from the house, but you do have a lot of shrubs there. There's a bird bath there, um, some other things. So areas you can treat, you know, again, those shrub areas, you know, up to maybe, you know, 10, 15 feet. These soffit areas and shrubs over here um, will all help you as far as um, you know, gaining control. Uh, again, I will say, you know, uh, one more time, you know, sometimes, you know, if you're going to go out a little bit further from the structure, uh, you may have to have different licensing. So please just make sure you do have the right, um, right licensing to, uh, to do this kind of treatment. So a little bit on, you know, some of the products that are out there today, um, just looking at, you know, some of the, uh, uh, some data points for you. So this is, um, this was actually treated foliage where they treated the leaves and they brought the leaves back inside and, and tested them with mosquitoes out to 60 days. So you can see a bunch of different products here. Um, you know, Scion did get out to, you know, 45 days on this one. This was at the mid rate um, and still we're getting about 90% control. Um, this is on something like a, a hardy board siding. So just giving you an idea of how different products can work on different surfaces. Um, these were aged 75 days, and then they were aged outside as well. And then mosquitoes uh, placed on, on some of those materials. And you can see within 30 minutes, you know, you had about 100% control at 75 days um, you know, with, with Scion, and then also uh, Suspend did pretty well out to 60 minutes. So um, there are good products out there uh, that can control mosquitoes. And... Uh, I think that's my last slide. So um, with mosquitoes, uh, you know, you have my contact information here. I know somebody wanted me to go back to the egg slide. So I'll jump back to that. Um, you know, there is an assurance program with our product Scion. It's a 75 day assurance program. Uh, any questions on that, give me a call. And one last thing is we do have our FMC True Champions program. This is a program that you can enroll in. It's a very simple enrollment, a one-time enrollment, uh, and you can gain some pretty good rewards from, uh, from FMC. So that's it. Thank you, Brian. Appreciate it. Um, why don't you, you can leave this up for a minute and then go yeah. back to the egg slide in a second. We have a bunch of questions. Uh, I'm going to start with this one. What is a mosquito's typical resting duration? Um, good question. Um, you know, if there's if there are species that, you know, isn't going to bite during the day, you know, they can hang out in a spot for for many hours. Uh, they don't want to be in that shaded area. They don't want to be out in the sunlight, you know, during the middle of the day, uh, because again, they're gonna they're gonna dry out. They're gonna desiccate there, and um, so they they'll rest, you know, periods of hours at a time. Okay. Um... Before we go forward with more questions, I'm going to put the quiz link in the chat so that you guys can go ahead and do the quiz. It is right there. The Survey Monkey quiz. Again, two minutes of your time while you're listening to us uh, answer some of these questions. Um, Keith, are CS micro encapsulated solutions created differently? Say that one more time. Are CS micro encapsulated solutions created differently? Hmm. I mean, they are a different type of formulation. So, you know, they are a caps, uh, encapsulated formulation. So different than something like an SC for sure. So basically you have an active ingredient um, within a, a, a coating that allows it to sit on a surface and potentially, you know, last a little bit longer on that surface. So yeah, there, there's definitely a difference to that versus like an SC or DC, something like that. Okay. Is it critical to spray the underside of leaves as with a mist blower or is just as effective to treat the top of leaves with a backpack sprayer? Yeah, good question. Um, I'll say that the one data point that I know on that, um, we actually did some research, gosh, probably about, eight or nine years ago looking at that. 
you know, was there a difference in control with just using a backpack or using a mist blower? Um, there wasn't a huge difference at all. Um, but with that said, though, I think, you know, with a mist blower, getting stuff up under that underside of the leaf, you know, is if you have it, you can do it. That's great. You know, it, it's not 100 percent necessary, but still, I think the better coverage you get, the better your control is going to be. Okay. Uh, Delaney, again, how deep of water is actually needed for mosquito development? Centimeters, millimeters, et cetera, for example. <sighs> Yeah, so, you know, certain species, you know, again, it can just be maybe an inch of water is enough. You know, it just depends on the species. And, um, you know, you can see like in some of those little containers, you know, if you have a couple inches in there, um, they're more than happy to move in. Some of the, um, you know, uh, areas where their temporary water is located, once that gets wet, you know, it has to, you know, be enough to, that they can actually cover their body in it. Um, but I would say, you know, an inch or two is probably plenty. Okay. Um, for the mosquito species that lay eggs in areas that only have water temporarily holding water, uh, what is the average length of time the water must be present for successful life cycle completion? Yeah. So life cycle, you know, to go through that is usually about I would say seven to 10 days, maybe 14 days, depending on temperatures and things like that. So you would have to have, you know, moisture there for that period of time. Yeah, if it dries up and, and, and something's in the larval stage, it's not gonna make it. And if I give one more plug for True Champions while people are completing the uh, quiz and as people begin to drop, before people begin to drop off, uh, as Brian alluded to, the FMC True Champions program is a free resource from FMC Professional Solutions. It's absolutely free to sign up at the link that's on the screen. And there's a number of different valuable resources in there for PMPs and LCOs alike, from resources like these, the various assurance programs that we have on Scion and Talstar, as well as uh, a plethora of different uh, business value added type uh, resources that are all part of the FMC True Champions programs that are in there. All the first Fridays are in there as a, as a resource for you to go back to and listen to, as well as the Dynamic Rewards Rebate Program. We will send you money just for signing up for the program, no reporting, no uploading of invoices. The rebate minimum, it's only a hundred dollar rebate minimum. So this isn't a crazy stretch by any means. So please take a look at that. It's at fmctruechampions.com. And should you have any specific questions, you can uh, reach out to your local key customer manager or FMC market specialist. Awesome, yeah, thanks Mike, appreciate that. A um, Couple more questions. We've got a, a little time here. One thing I'm gonna do um, when you're done with the quiz, Go ahead and I'm gonna put in the link into the chat box to register for next month's webinar. Um, if you can make it, great. If you cannot, uh, there is also a link to the program that Mike just talked about, the True Champions, where you can enroll through that. So uh, that'll help you out a couple of different ways. Um, Lori has a question. If you put in Gambusia, would they eat the predaceous cope pods? Um, say that one more time on the copepods there what were they looking for on that if you put in gamb gambusia yeah would they eat the predaceous copepods i don't believe so it's a good question but i i don't i don't think so okay uh do mosquitoes in the tree canopies only feed on birds which is why 25 feet is the cap of application. Yeah, so they'll, they'll feed on birds, but they'll feed on us as well. Um, and if you remember on um, uh, West Nile, you know, birds are definitely a big link in that chain of, of uh, transmission. So, you know, they feed on birds, but they will come down, they will feed on us as well. So it's not, it's not just, uh, just birds. Okay. Um, Jeff is asking, are there specific traps used for uh, Felix and trees? If so, who makes them? Yeah, this, there's, there's CDC traps, they call them. 
Um, one place you used to be able to get them was, um, uh, what was the name of the company? Um, I believe it was BioQuip, but I think they may have gone out of business this year. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, if you look for, you know, um, uh, the CDC light traps, you know, you, you can definitely do a search and find those. Okay. Uh, Donald was asking, what about the concerns of frogs and lizards? As far as treating with, you know, I'm guessing as far as treating, you know, waters with, you know, whether it's a, a BTI or, or something like that. Um, yeah, as far as I know, because these things are, are mainly uh, attacking uh, mosquitoes, the, um, any IGRs that can be used there are attacking really the molting process of a mosquito. So as far as other, um, uh, other animals that, you know, frogs really aren't molting. So typically not, a, not an issue with them. Um, so mo most things that are, that are labeled for use in those aquatic environments, uh, in order to get that type of registration or that use, they've been tested, you know, to the nines. I mean, just, you know, very, very thoroughly to make sure there are no um, off target uh, species impacts. Okay, Alicia is wondering as a whole, are you of the school of thought of using a pyrethroid plus an IGR routinely? I've had many people come to me that have pros for and against, and we have done things both ways. Yeah, so you know, the idea of using an IGR with your residual mosquito program, um, what I'll say is it, it can't hurt you to do it. Uh, I was at the AMCA meeting, gosh, about four years ago when a lot of this was first coming up. Uh, there were some studies shown there that, you know, the thought was that the IGR, when you sprayed it out, it would get on the female mosquito she would then go to lay eggs and the IGR would move off of her onto the eggs. As she laid them, then they wouldn't be able to um, complete their, their life, process, life cycle. Um, they didn't necessarily see a lot of that in the testing that was done for that uh, for, by AMCA, uh, or at least one of their presenters there. Um, you know, if you have a lot of breeding sources around a structure. So where you're actually gonna be treating with that IGR. Um, so a lot of little like, you know, cans of water or things like that. Um, you get some of it into those areas, you know, and a mosquito tries to lay an egg in there, I, I think it's gonna help. But not, not a, from what I've seen, not a huge necessity um, and not a huge impact uh, by putting it in your mix. It, it, it definitely can't hurt you. It may help you a little bit, but I don't think it's like, a, you know, you're gonna see 25% more control by adding that in. I, I don't, I don't think so. Okay, we got three minutes left and we got a few more questions. Actually, we have a lot. And if we don't get to them, we'll try to answer these in our follow-up email. Uh, I'll just mention this. Uh, Lori mentioned that she just called BioQuip. They are open and she put the phone number in the chat. So, okay. um, so you all, all know that that's in there. Okay. Uh, Haley. How do guys treat 25 feet in the air? Yeah, it's tough, you know, unless you have, um, you know, a, 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 probably a, a tank with a, with a hose attached to it uh, and you have enough PSI to get up there. Um, again, you know, and what I'll say is you don't, you don't have to treat up that high. I mean, you don't, you know, if you can't get up that high, you know, I wouldn't say don't worry about it, but, you know, if you can get up 15 feet, 20 feet, um, you're going to have a really good impact because that mosquito is not going to just stay up at say 25 feet. They're going to be moving up and down in that, that tree uh, canopy. So chances are they're going to land on an area that was treated. Um, that's kind of like the, the range from the ground up to 25 feet. So, you know, you don't have to go out and get like a massive tree sprayer like they do for, you know, wood boring beetles out West. Uh, they're shooting up 50 feet. Um, so again, I, I wouldn't be so concerned about it, but really what I would, what I say is if you know you have a lot of Culex in your area and you're treating a, a, a property and you're not seeing control like you think you should, um, then maybe look at going up a little bit higher if you can or trying to fight, figure out a way to do that. Perfect. Okay, we have several questions. We're not gonna get to them. Um, sorry, but uh, we're at our <laughs> limit. We know everybody's gotta go back to work. <laughs> and uh, so uh, I do want to mention that 
Uh, we do have uh, an opportunity coming forward where there's going to be another webinar through Landscape Management and PMP Magazine, where they're going to talk a little bit more about uh, mosquitoes, but also about some marketing um, options for for professionals. That kind of thing. That's coming up later in March, and so our follow-up email will uh, share information on that. So uh, just again, want to thank you all. Look for our follow-up email, and I'm going to pass it along to Mike to close us out. All right, great. Thanks, Ed. Brian, as always, great content and valuable resources for the uh, pest and welfare community. Jason, thanks again, and welcome to FMC. We appreciate that. Jason's a great asset in the field. So again, thanks again for participating in today's event. Look forward to the follow-up emails for this and future First Friday's events. And as always, thanks for supporting FMC. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you all.